So this is uh, this is Annie Drian, and um, what we have down here is that she's actually CEO of Cosmos Studios, but she worked on the Voyager Interstellar record, as I recall. She was in, wrote um, the movie, um, co-wrote the movie Contact. Um, she worked on a number of Carl's things. She was a novelist in her own right, and also the Interstellar. Um, what is no. it called now? The Interstellar. I uh, creative director of the Voyager Interstellar Record, I think. But I'm thinking about the, sa the solar sail. Oh, yes, and I also uh, was project manager of uh, the attempt at the first solar sail, and happy to say that I think we've raised the seed money for the next attempt at a solar sail. But I think I'm most proud of the fact that I was the co-writer of the Cosmos television series with Carl Sagan and Steve Soder. And um, it's my fate to speak to you when we're all in a collective blood sugar dive. And uh, there's been a lot of talking. Uh, my heart was racing when I was listening to the previous speaker's comments, and I found myself becoming enraged. So I'm going to try to calm myself down and to speak rationally and to tell you where I'm coming from. And I want to tell you about my grandparents, who were the most profoundly religious people I have ever known. They were very poor. They were Latvian Jews, Orthodox Jews. And um, my grandfather was so devout that even when he was dying of stomach cancer, and he had a dispensation in the table of Jewish laws, the Shulchan Aruch, which said that he could ride on the Sabbath, he refused to do so. My grandmother, if a meat fork would accidentally come in contact with a dairy spoon, would run to the backyard to bury the, bury the offending utensil uh, until it was, uh, once again, a dairy fork. My grandparents were so poor that they couldn't afford uh, the dues for the synagogue. And so my grandfather, in the coldest of winters in Queens, New York, was the watchman of the synagogue at night while it was being built, stood outside all night long to guard the synagogue. Now, my father is an atheist. And uh, what's interesting about this is that my father and my grandparents had the most beautiful relationship. They, I never saw my father, who was, who was an educated man, ever give his uneducated parents so much as even a dirty look. Not even, you know, an impatient moment. They adored each other. There was no hint of conflict between them, which I found amazing. Not at all like my mother's family. And so I once asked my father, how come you don't believe in God at all? Grandma and Grandpa believe in God with all their hearts and all their souls. And yet, you seem in such great harmony with each other. And this is the story my father told me. And it has really set the course of my life. My father said that he came home from NYU after his first term there, rode the subway back to Queens, rehearsing all the way what he would say to my grandfather comes into the house and finds my grandfather enveloped in his phylacteries and his talus, deep in prayer at the kitchen table, davening. So deep in prayer that he didn't even notice that my father was standing there. My father, trembling, waited until my grandfather emerged from his trance. And when my grandfather opened his eyes and saw my father standing there, he smiled as if my father was the answer to his prayers. And he went up to kiss my father, and my father said, Pop, no, stay back. I want to tell you something. I'm not going to pray anymore. I'm not going to keep kosher anymore. I'm not going to daven. I'm not going to go to shul. I'm not going to walk on Shabbos because it's all bullshit. I don't believe it, and I'm not going to do it anymore. 
So I said to my father, well, what did Grandpa say? And my father told me that his father looked at him, and he said, well, the only sin would be to pretend. Now, that's a story that most people find very surprising because we're so used to the idea that religious people would rather have us pretend that religion is not really about the belief in God. I mean, my grandfather really believed in God, and so he felt that the idea of paying lip service was useless. It, was, uh, it would be a lie. And that's, I think, such an exemplary uh, instance of what that kind of devotion can be. It wasn't about social coercion. It wasn't about imposing you know, your fear of death or your desire to be immortal or your desire to be special or belong to a special group. He wasn't afraid of the peer pressure that he would experience from his friends if they knew that his son didn't believe because it was just about really believing. I've been very lucky, as you can see, in the people in my life. And, uh, and my relationship with Carl Sagan, my 20 years, my 20 trips around the sun with him, was, of course, the most beautiful and blessed good fortune that I've ever had. Now, this, uh, De Deuteronomy has taken a real beating here today, as has Leviticus. But in Deuteronomy, there is something called the Via Haftor prayer, which says that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, and that these words that I command you this day, God is alleged to have said, you shall think of when you risest up, when you liest down, when you walkest by the way. And you should keep this, these words as frontlets between thine eyes. Well, as a kid, I didn't have any idea what frontlets were. I imagined they were sort of like sunglasses. But it was a notion that there was a way of seeing, that religion was a kind of a, a way of seeing, that you should keep, and everything should be seen through this filter, and it should be in your consciousness at all times. Now, there was a time when religion and science were one, before the modern scientific revolution. And, you know, anything that was even the antecedents of, of what science is today was done in a religious context. At that time, this fledgling science was called saving the appearances. That was really the job of science. It was to save the appearances, to save the religious story of nature and not to conflict with it. So, for instance, Copernicus, he, um, he has a problem, and that is that the Earth-centered vision creates a calendar which is impossible so to produce a reliable, consistent day to celebrate Easter. And so part of the reason that Copernicus takes on this problem is to develop a calendrical solution so that everyone can celebrate Easter on the same day. Well, of course, Copernicus <coughs> and the <coughs> other creators of the modern scientific revolution created a situation in which there was a great parting of the ways between science and religion. The religious view of nature was no longer a tenable story. And people who really wanted to understand nature were forced to depart from that, to go off on their own, to develop a new, thank you, what do we have here? Oh, it's very, it's very nice, and how British of you, really. 